Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight on Cinema Showcase, I'm very pleased to have as my guest a fine actor and author, Mr. Jean-Pierre Ramon. He has had success on the stage, films and television, and right now he's starring with Myrna Loy at the Midnight Sun Dinner Theater in Neil Simon's Barefoot in the Park. Join me tonight as I talk with Jean-Pierre Ramon on Cinema Showcase. Welcome to tonight's Cinema Showcase, and join me in welcoming Jean-Pierre Ramon. It is indeed a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, sir. I hope you are enjoying our, uh, our city so far. I certainly am, yes. It's a very friendly city, I yeah. found. Everybody says that, and I wonder if, it's, if I would feel the same way if I were a visitor coming here, if I would feel it as friendly as everybody says it is. Well, but, uh, Southern hospitality is very famous <laughs> all over the world. I want to tell you how much I enjoyed Barefoot in the Park. Oh, it's, good. Uh, one of Neil Simon's best, if maybe not his best. Do you think it's up there with among his uh, better things? I think it's uh, it's the most human. Uh, the others, uh, I mean, some uh, like the odd couple of California, are extremely funny too. Mm -hmm. But this one, Barefoot in the Park, is is funny. But at the same time, the relationship between the people are so true, so uh, real, down to earth. And what makes the fantastic uh, success of, of that play it makes it a classic in, uh, in its uh, category is that uh, audiences identify, N not with my part because he is a crazy, a little eccentric. <laughs> zany, eccentric <laughs> foreign character, but with the mother, uh, all the mothers uh, recognize themselves and the young couple struggling uh, to get into a, a new apartment and uh, all the problems they meet is so true, so real. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's what really makes most of Simon's plays so successful. He writes really about ordinary people involved in ordinary situations. Yes. And really life, I suppose, is not without humor. So maybe that's why audiences find them so, um, so funny. Yes. Yeah. And so near to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the first time you've done dinner theater? No, I played uh, South Pacific in uh, Meadowbrook and uh, other cities in uh, dinner theaters. At first, um, I, was, uh, I was afraid when my agent told me you are going to play dinner theater because I would imagine there would be a lot of noise, <laughs> but not at all. The audiences are as uh, attentive as in a real theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the, the, the waiters don't operate uh, during the play. They wait for the intermissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the contrary, the fact, I think, that the people uh, en enjoyed their dinner there and didn't have to rush to find a taxi or to park their car mm -hmm. uh, and arriving late at the theater, that they can stay at the same place, uh, creates a kind of warm, uh, pleasant atmosphere. Yeah. Because I would think that would be one of the worst things for an actor would, in doing any sort of play at a, a theater that is not a dinner theater, to be doing the play and all of these people straggling in late. That would seem to me to drive an actor crazy. Yes, it does. I mean, uh, <coughs> that would be terrible. That you did happens. South Pacific. I'm, I want to talk about that a little later, but since you brought it up, let's, let me talk about that now. That is, to me, one of the uh, the greatest musicals ever written, marvelous Rodgers and Hammerstein songs. Was it? How did you enjoy playing in it? Well, on one hand, I enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, on the other hand, I was terrified when the song "Some Enchanted oh. Evening" would start because I had already done a, a musical on Broadway. I'm not a singer. Mm -hmm. uh, with Vivian Lee, we did uh, Tovarich oh, yeah. twelve years ago, and. Um, God knows we were terrified too to have <laughs> to sing for the first time in our lives. But 
uh, the songs were brand new. Nobody knew them before, yeah. so there wouldn't be any comparison uh, uh, made. And uh, even if we went uh, off key, people could imagine that's <laughs> the way it was written. But some enchanted evening is such a classic. I mean, millions of records of uh, Ezio Pinza have been sold, and it's like the national anthem, yeah. more or less. So I was really terrified of that. And I would uh, ask the, the conductor to start the tune ahead of me <laughs> so that I would <laughs> be sure to hit the right uh, <laughs> note. But um, he didn't want to do that. And I didn't want to start, so it <laughs> there were long <laughs> pauses uh, who we would yield and start first. <laughs> so I started to, finally I found the trick. I, I started to talk it. Mm -hmm. as if it were part of the dialogue, and little by little I would feel my way and then start singing. <laughs> that is a... Uh, I wonder when the first time a song was talk sung. Everybody says that it was Rex Harrison in My Fair Lady. I guess so. Yeah, he really started something there, yes. didn't he? Yes, because uh, before that, uh, the, the great musicals uh, like Oklahoma, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, all had real singles to yeah. uh, singing to the tilt. Yeah. All right, having done television, films, the stage. Can you honestly say you prefer one over the other? Oh yes, the stage. No Why? doubt about that. Well, number one, uh, because of the, of the the contact, the presence of the uh, the audience, which makes it different every night. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I, uh, I always dreamt of being a stage actor since I was born, practically. And uh, when I was a kid, I would uh, learn uh, by heart uh, all of uh, Shakespeare, Racine, Molière. Shakespeare in French, because I didn't speak English mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and when I did my first film, I thought, oh, well, that's very nice, but that's probably going to be the last, and this is not my... Well, finally, I did about 76 or 78, <laughs> but um, I still consider myself that's primarily a stage actor. Mm. Everybody I have talked to who has been trained on the stage say that they really prefer the stage, yeah. and I suppose for that very reason, the. Um, the closeness with the audience. Oh, yes. Because it's, it's an immediate recognition, isn't it? And also you can improve every night. Yeah. Uh, which you can't uh, in the movies, of course. Well, what do you do if, if you're in a long run? How do you keep the performance as fresh the third month as you do the first month or whatever? Well, that was a big fight every night between Vivian Lee and myself because we played it a whole year on Broadway. And uh, after a certain amount of time, I would try to vary my uh, intonations and to surprise her. And uh, she would say, uh, don't do that. <laughs> she had set uh, what she was going to do at the first rehearsal and wouldn't move uh, uh, from it. And she said, you are, you are an amateur. All French people are amateurs. <laughs> And uh, one day I found in uh, Life magazine an article signed by Laurence Olivier, who, was, who uh, had been her husband mm -hmm. for 20 years and his greatest English actor, who said exactly what I tried to prove, which is that after a certain amount of time, to prevent uh, uh, the performances to become mechanical and stale, you have to invent little things and vary your, your readings. And he said that uh, he did it on purpose uh, uh, in certain places to uh, change the, the, the props, uh, not put them at the same place and so on, in order to keep uh, the other actors and himself on their toes. And I uh, uh, tore that uh, article and put it on uh, Vivian Lee's uh, dressing table. And when she saw that uh, Laurence Olivier uh, <laughs> felt the same way I did. She didn't uh, call me an amateur any longer. <laughs> what happens, though, if you, and I imagine this could happen more in a comedy or a musical than in a drama, if you have an audience that, let's say, responds one night to something they did not respond to the previous night, or vice versa? I mean, how do you, that how do you tune yourself into that? Especially in comedy. Yeah. That uh, uh, happens to us all the time. Well, uh, when we are used to certain laughs, if they don't come a, a certain night, we, are, we feel miserable. Uh, we are sure that we did something wrong. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, if a laugh, sometimes a laugh would happen, uh, 
and then we would try to for the first time and we would try to get it again the the, the following day and it it would never happen uh, anymore it's very mysterious that's what makes it exciting there yeah. are no rules yeah all right having played for audiences really all over the world I imagine audiences from country to country differ in, in their reactions to things, don't they? Not that much. Uh, I played at least three plays, both in French and in English. And uh, when the laughs come from the situation, uh, they, uh, they come at the same place. Hmm. Uh, where they don't come, if it's a line is uh, witty in one language and is not uh, in the other. If it's uh, pure dialogue, uh, then it's difficult to find an equivalence for the, for the writer and uh, sometimes the, uh, the actor can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. But situation laughs are the same all over the world, or mm -hmm. at least between uh, France and, uh, and the United States. Yeah. I cannot s speak <laughs> about the Chinese <laughs> or the Hindus. Yeah, all right. Having done, goodness knows, a lot of acting, you've also written plays. Yes. Do you think being an actor gives you any more insight into writing plays than if you had not acted? Yes, I do. I do. It gives us uh, the, the sense of, of the tempo, of, uh, it helps us for the dialogue, uh, it helps us to know how to make a character exit uh, or enter the stage. I'm sure it does. Mm -hmm. And yet, there are so many, great, so many great writers who, for one reason or another, attempt to write plays. Let's say a novelist will attempt to write a play or a screenplay and cannot do it. For example, F. Scott Fitzgerald could never write a good screenplay. And I would imagine it's because they don't speak in the language of, um, of the actor. Probably. I've often wondered about that. Do you think that's true? They are used to uh, write uh, descriptively um, uh, and uh, about inner emotions, and uh, they don't have the uh, the tempo necessary and the contraction necessary for stage plays. Yeah, yeah. Do you enjoy writing? Yeah. Yes, I do more and more. Yeah, I published a book in uh, in Paris a year ago, uh, which was a bestseller, very successful. So it has been translated in English, and it's going to be published here the 13th of May, in oh. a few weeks. Mm -hmm. It's called Sun and Shadow. Uh -huh. And it's a kind of uh, autobiography, uh, a little bit in the same line as uh, David Niven's. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, our lives have been very much parallel. Really? Yes, uh, with uh, Hollywood and mm -hmm. the stage and the war. And well, I think he's written a second volume of... Uh, which is wonderful, too. Yeah. Both are great. Yeah. Everyone says that writing is such a lonely profession or such a lonely job. Did you find it to be that way? No, I think uh, you, are, you are much more proud of yourself. Hmm. Uh, after a day you have been writing, uh, even if the day after you decide it's no good and you throw it in the basket, it doesn't matter. The, the mere fact of having created something of your own, alone, as you say, mm -hmm. uh, is a great joy. That's right. And I know, for instance, that uh, I had fantastic reviews from, as a matter of fact, I got two literary prizes, one from the French Academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reviews I got for my book made me much more happy and proud than if I had had the same reviews as an actor. Huh. Definitely. Yeah. When did you decide that, um, that acting was going to be your life. Is this something you had always wanted to yes, do? Yes, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be an actor. Really? Yes. And what do you consider the, um, the first big push, the first thing that, that put you before? Well, the I was you very wanted. lucky because uh, when I was uh, 18, I met uh, Jean Cocteau, who is oh. one of our great uh, yes. was, uh, writers and poets, and uh, he was looking for a young man to play Oedipus in the Infernal Machine, which mm -hmm. is the legend of Oedipus and the Sphinx and Jocasta. And uh, he tested me and uh, signed me, and I became a star overnight uh, that young, uh, thanks to this uh, fantastic play and fantastic part. Mm. And did you have people around you who were encouraging you? Because they often say that that's one of the most important things a young actor can have. No, I didn't. 
I mean, my parents were very comprehensive and very nice. They never, they never did anything uh, to prevent me f from being an actor. But on the other hand, I wouldn't say they encouraged me. Yeah. yeah. Until after I had that success, then they were <laughs> happy, of course. <laughs> Who were the, um, the early influences on your acting? Uh, well, that uh, man, uh, Jean Cocteau, mm -hmm. and uh, as a director, a man called Louis Jouvet. I mm -hmm. don't know if you would know him in here, mm -hmm. who had his own theater. And, and then uh, a great friend of mine uh, was Jean-Louis Barrault, yeah. uh, the actor in Children of Paradise, mm -hmm. but apart from uh, being an actor, he's, uh, he has his own theater and he's a director. And I just played uh, last year in 76 with his wife, uh, Madeleine Renaud, uh, directed by him, a play by Marguerite Duras, mm -hmm. which is one of the most uh, important things I've, uh, I've done. We did also the film, mm -hmm. which has just been released now. Yeah. At the time you made um, Cross of Lorraine, you did that at MGM, right? didn't you? That studio was, uh, I suppose, the biggest in Hollywood. Oh, yes. And uh, MGM Pictures all over the world were big. Did you have any uh, apprehension about working at MGM, about... Uh, with all well, of I these couldn't believe my eyes when uh, I went to the commissary for lunch and, and I would find myself sitting with uh, Myrna Loy mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Greta Garbo and Joan Crawford and Norma Scherer and Clark Gable and R Robert Montgomery. Uh, it seemed to me uh, another world. Yeah. That time, though, at MGM was so incredible, especially for us looking back on it today. When you think of how many great people were under contract at that studio. Oh, it was fantastic. It's amazing. And that picture, Cross of Lorraine, is certainly one that, well, to say that it holds up well is an understatement. I think it's a great film. Well, I'm very happy because they keep showing it uh, on the late show, or late, 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 I don't know now. <laughs> <coughs> and that was done by, Tay, Tay Garnett directed that. That's right. Didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Now, at what point did you, you made Cross of Lorraine and several other pictures. Did you go back to France during that period, during the war? Uh? Yes, I did two films, uh, Assignment in Brittany mm -hmm. and The Cross of Lorraine. And then I asked to be released from my contract because I wanted to join the army, mm -hmm. the Free French uh, forces. So uh, Mr. Louis B. Meyer wasn't very happy about my decision, but that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And um, so I went and stayed in the army uh, two years and a half until the end of the war. And then I came back uh, to MGM. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't de do too many films at MGM after that, uh, that except Lily. Yeah. Lily was one uh, I did there. But the others, uh, they uh, loaned me to, uh, to other studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lily, my goodness, is a picture that is certainly considered a classic film. Yes. It keeps popping up all the time, and especially now in the last few years that the MGM musicals have taken on sort of a, a new life. Yes. But it is a remarkable film. It's, it was a small film. It wasn't very one of the, small the big MGM musicals. Nobody uh, uh, thought it would be that successful. They were very surprised. That's something that always intrigues me about a film that goes on to become a, uh, a classic, is do the people involved at the time have any feeling that, my goodness, we're doing something here that's going to uh, catch I don't on? And I don't think so. At mm -hmm. least not us. Definitely not. Yeah. We thought it was charming. Um, but we didn't expect that uh, exceptional success. Yeah. Leslie Caron was marvelous in that. Oh, yes. Marvelous. Of all the films you've done, do you have a favorite? Um, I think it's uh, Day for Night. Ah. Because uh, I uh, enjoyed working with uh, Truffaut more than with uh, any other director, and also the, uh, the atmosphere of... Uh, all of us uh, was of great uh, friendship, uh, mm -hmm. Jacqueline Bisset and uh, Valentina Cortese. It was a very happy uh, film mm -hmm. on top of being successful. Yeah. What is Truffaut like to work with? How does oh, he He's wonderful. He's wonderful because he leaves a great deal of freedom uh, to his actors, and that is something I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, he doesn't say, Jean-Pierre, you will play this scene this way? No, not he at all. I mean, he guides us, but he, he let us uh, imagine, uh, try things, and uh, even uh, adding dialogue or changing it, 
if he feels it's uh, right for the part. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wouldn't let us uh, do anything. Uh, but it's so uh, nice compared to some directors who treat you like a piece of wood and say, uh, you, you go there, you count one, two, you say that. I mean, that's no fun. Yeah, that would seem to me to be really defeating your own purpose as a director because you want the actor to contribute, I would think. I don't understand I know, how but some directors uh, think that they, they know better and that uh, they have decided uh, ahead of time before the, the picture started how the scene should be played and uh, they don't take into consideration the personality of the actor. They just want to... Yeah. Or you have directed films. No. You have never directed a film? No. And I wouldn't be a good director, I'm sure. Why I wouldn't not? have the I wouldn't have the patience, the uh, the philosophy, the comprehension necessary. No. Yeah, I think I guess that is one thing that a director, a good director, must have is patience. Oh yes. Because in any given film, when you have three or four or five actors who are actors of stature, let's say, you're going to have four or five different temperaments, and you're going to have to deal with them. Yes. And so a director must have patience. What films are you, um, are you working on now? Do you have anything in the offing? Uh, I don't know. I have that one that's uh, just released in, uh, in Paris, uh, <coughs> Days in the Trees. <coughs> and um, I don't know yet what uh, the next one will be. Mm -hmm. What about writing? Are you currently working on anything? Like yes, that? I'm working on a new uh, book, a, a novel uh, this time. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that, can you tell us what that's going to be about? It will be a love story. That's Good. all I can tell you about. I'm being uh, taking place in uh, Paris, London, Rome, uh, New York, Hollywood. That's good because... And maybe Atlanta. Maybe I'll add a, a chapter about Atlanta. Because we don't have enough good love stories today, I don't think. Do you think the state of... Um, getting back to, to the theater, because this is one thing I wanted to talk about with you. Do you think the state of, of theater in the world today is very healthy? Do you think great, great plays that we're going to be watching 25, 30, 50 years from now are being written today? Well, it's very hard to... Uh, That's a, a big question, I know. But it's a big question. Yeah. Uh, about today, I don't know, but uh, about yesterday, I would say that the plays of Beckett will, uh, will remain mm -hmm. uh, classics forever. Uh, the plays of Ionesco, I, uh, uh, I think so too. Mm -hmm. And O'Neill, certainly. O'Neill, yeah. Tennessee Williams, mm -hmm. uh, but that's just the point, because I don't think, whereas Tennessee Williams' plays, his great plays, Streetcar, so forth, were written um, 25 years ago, I can't think of anything, well, I can too, I can think of Equus. I'm sure that play will probably yes, be around. that's a good example. But uh, I just don't think we have as many good plays today as we had 25 or 30 years ago. And I wonder if that same situation prevails in France, in... Uh, in Germany, wherever. I don't know. Um, what, what is happening in France that there's a, a, a sharper definition. On the one hand, the uh, light commercial plays uh, performed in regular theaters, and on the other hand, uh, avant garde tryout uh, plays performed in uh, little. Uh, barns or mm -hmm. cafe or whatever and uh, the, 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 the separation between the two seemed to be much stronger than it was before there were in the uh, years uh, 10 years ago let's say uh, a lot of plays that would not uh, belong to uh, either the, the, the great commercial successes nor to the avant-garde there would be uh, middle of the road plays and this uh, sentimental romantic uh, uh, or even politically minded, uh, and this seem uh, to have disappeared. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because in this country, as you know, uh, I think so many good plays are being done regionally. Not only in, it used to be in New York was the only place where you could see good, exciting theater. But now you can see great theater in Los Angeles, you can see it uh, in Detroit, you can see it in Atlanta. Oh, yes. I think that's very healthy. That I think is very healthy too, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Getting back to, uh, if we could, to Tavaric, just a minute. That, as you say, ran for over a year on Broadway yes. uh, with Vivian Lee. What was she like uh, to work with? You related the little incident about um, keeping the play well, fresh, but everyone can say, especially in Atlanta, with Gone to the Wind. That's right. Vivian Lee is the, the great actress. Um, I speak about <laughs> her uh, at great length in my book, mm -hmm. uh, Sun and Shadow. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are two whole chapters oh. about her, and especially about her in Tavarich, mm -hmm. uh, because she was enchanting when she was in good health. Yeah. And uh, in the last month of the play, she became uh, very ill and was very difficult uh, to work with. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you read the book, as I hope you will, uh, you learn uh, more about it. It's very difficult for me to, to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, she was certainly a, um, a great actress and I think could play really any kind of role, as yeah, she, she proved with... Um, with musicals like Tavaric. It's marvelous. And uh, uh, apart from being a great actress, she, she had a kind of uh, magic. Uh, a, uh, I mean, the minute she entered the stage, uh, there was something happening. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say glamour because there have been. Uh, glamour is more connected with uh, movies and John Crawford and people like that, but magic, yeah. I think. Well, I guess that's what makes. Some actresses are Vivian Lee and others are Sally Swartz or whatever. Not to knock Sally Swartz, but I don't know who Sally Swartz is. Uh, where do you go from Atlanta after you conclude Barefoot in the Park? At the well, I'm summer? going to do uh, about two months of a promotion for my book. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know because uh, they have asked uh, Myrna and I to uh, do this summer some uh, weeks with Barefoot uh, in the Park. Uh, in the East, in uh, New England, and so mm -hmm. on. <coughs> so I don't know yet if, if we are going to do it. Yeah. Well, I want to wish you much success with the continuation of Barefoot in the Park here at the Midnight Sun, and I hope everybody will go see it because it's a funny play. And I hope you've enjoyed this half hour. Yeah, I certainly did. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to all of you for watching. Until next time, good night. <laughs>